Hi everyone, welcome to uh, the 2021 Food Safety Showcases brought to you by the FPSA and the Food Safety Network. My name is Elena Sierra. I'm the Director of Networks and uh, Special Projects for FPSA. Uh, coming today for our first Food Safety Showcase is PSSI's Ryan, Lily, and Josie. Um, they're bringing the topic of plant-based meat industry trends and food safety concerns. Um, this is an important session to our network because, uh, as many of you know, this has been a growing industry throughout the United States and abroad. And we feel that there's some very important food safety issues and, and expertise that PSSI can bring to this conversation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to Lily. Are you up first? Yes, I am. Thank you, Elena. Um, and welcome everybody this afternoon. I am our director of sales for PSSI. I've been with the company 10 years and very excited uh, to tell you a little bit about PSSI and also some of the industry uh, trends around uh, the plant-based uh, industry. So with that, Elena, we can go to the next slide. So we'd like to tell you a little bit more about us and we can go to the uh, next slide as well, Elena. So PSSI has been in business for over 40 years. Uh, we are the world-class leader in uh, contract sanitation and food safety solutions. We are currently cleaning um, over 400 facilities uh, and an emerging number of them are, are plant-based facilities or part of them. Um, and in order to be successful, uh, we do employ only full-time uh, senators to the tune of over 17,000 of them currently. And uh, in order to do that, we do have over a hundred uh, field management. So we are uh, part of uh, USDA, FDA, CFIA, uh, BRC, SQF audits to the tunes of hundreds on a daily basis. Next slide, Elena. And then the next one, please. So we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the source and you know what is the plant-based uh, meat industry. Obviously, it is one of the fastest growing segments in the whole uh, food industry to the tune of almost $5 billion across the globe um, with over the next five years, uh, a target of getting close to $10 billion. So, uh, that is a annual growth rate of over 14%. And um, we wanted to share what are the sources of this uh, industry. So as you can see from the graph, um, the largest source would be uh, soy products representing 57%. Second to that would be wheat products uh, comprising of 24%, 14% uh, for P, and then there's a um, category of 5% for all other. Uh, next slide, Alina, please. All right, and then as far as breaking down this industry with what PSSI is seeing with our, our partners that we uh, are privileged to partner with, for uh, meat product, um, it's probably not really a big surprise that the uh, largest segment is uh, beef-related uh, products, second to that chicken and pork, and other is primarily represented uh, by the seafood uh, type uh, of industry. And then as far as product type, again, not really a big surprise, but that would be represented by um, primarily burgers, second to that would be strips and nuggets, and then sausages would be third and, and some other. Next slide, Elena, please. All right, so as far as what is driving this trend, 
Uh -huh. Obviously, the number one would be the increased awareness of the benefits to a vegetarian or a flexitarian diet. Second to that would be all of the investment that is going into product development of these types of products. Um, many of our partners, as I mentioned, uh, we have new partners um, that are our startups, just as we have uh, large global national companies that are uh, getting into this market and at the forefront of it today, coupled by there's a lot of government um, investment from a sustainability or environmental component to it. In addition to that, obviously with the internet and so forth, there's also just a overall growing awareness of any animal-borne uh, illnesses, and obviously that information is disseminated immediately. And then if we think about what are the barriers to this industry, well, obviously the number one would be cost. It's not easy or inexpensive to start up a uh, food processing uh, facility anywhere in the country, um, particularly uh, in North America. Second to that, for a barrier would be allergens to some of the ingredient sources that we mentioned earlier. And then obviously COVID is having an impact um, overall with not just this industry, but most in general. So from a trend uh, standpoint, um, and with regards to where the U.S. stands uh, within this industry, the current U.S. market represents $860 million, which puts it at number three for market share of that $4.6 billion. Um, so we are number three, uh, with Europe representing uh, number one of 35% of that market, and Asia uh, representing number two. The U.S. Um, does have the greatest growth potential with a annual uh, runway of 16.1% between now and 2026. And with that, Alina, I'd like us to go to the next slide and I will share uh, the conversation with uh, Ryan Batty, our Assistant Director of Food Safety, who's now gonna talk to you about master sanitation, the importance of the uh, scheduling of that and the importance of sanitary design when it comes to plant-based versus the animal-based uh, products. Yep. Thank you, Lily. So again, my name is Ryan Batty. I'm the Assistant Food Safety Director for PSSI. I've been PSSI for 19 years, and I'm part of the PSSI FAST team, which stands for the Field Audit and Support Team. The FAST team's main function is to perform uh, high-level and detailed sanitation and food safety uh, audits or assessments at uh, food processing facilities. We do them all across North America. So some of these assessments are used as proactive tools to help prevent food safety issues in plants. Uh, but some are to mitigate food safety issues that have already been identified in plants. So, so what I do, going to facilities, uh, whether it be for proactive reasons or for mitigation, and normally it's microbial mitigation. Uh, I watch the production, I watch the sanitation processes for uh, a few days. These audits take about four days. I inspect the facility. I take hundreds of pictures and identify opportunities to improve the food safety uh, at the facility uh, and to find root causes of environmental microbial issues. I also take ATP swabs and I assist with the plant's environmental monitoring programs. Then I gather up all the information, all the data, I present it to the plant and then we begin the process of correcting uh, the food safety opportunities that, that we found. So I just wanted to share with everybody uh, the most common food safety issues that pertain to master sanitation schedules and sanitary design that I see out there in the field from a sanitation perspective. So I know that we're talking about plant-based uh, meat industry topics here, uh, but these slides are kind of universal to the food industry. So it doesn't matter if we're talking about plant-based or protein-based or bakeries, uh, these pertain to all of them because uh, the, the bottom line is, uh, uh, we have pathogens in food plants, and that's what we're trying to control in all of them. So let's take a look at uh, some of the master sanitation schedule issues that I see out in the field. So, Elena, you can go to the next slide, please. So, master sanitation schedule. Let's start at the top. Roof services. For those of you who do work in food plants, uh, it's time to get up and inspect your roof. We're finding more and more that the root cause of environmental issues, particularly listeria issues, are coming from the roofs, especially if your ceiling uh, in your processing area uh, is leaking. 
and your processing area has has plastic hanging everywhere, so which is a bad thing. So make sure that the roof surface at your plant is on a master sanitation schedule and that it's being inspected. You may need to install water drops up there, but make sure it's getting clean. Some plants do it monthly, other others are on different frequencies. It all depends on your, your roof structure, the environment, uh, the food process, uh, the exhaust systems. But you see the bottom right picture here on this slide shows my colleague taking an environmental sponge on a roof of a facility that is now closed, but you see how filthy and dirty that roof is. Uh, and it tested positive for listeria that was leaking down to the plant and it was a root cause of the main issue for the facility. So you can go to the next slide, Elena, please. So another master sanitation schedule issue that I see out there is the roof air units. So while you're up on the roof, uh, checking it out, check out how the air is blowing into your processing areas. You gotta look at the units <clears throat> and the, the, the systems to ensure that they're clean and that they're on the master sanitation schedule. These get neglected all the time, even if they are on mass, master sanitation schedule, because rarely is the this work, this cleaning of these units, uh, it's rarely inspected, you know, quality assurance people, uh, uh, nobody wants to go up on the roof and this isn't part of pre -op, so. Uh, make make sure that these are being checked, but we got to make sure that the air that's blowing in, into our plant is filtered uh, and that the duct work after filtration is clean and is accessible to be cleaned. If you see the upper right hand corner, that's a duct going all the way down into a plant that has no side panels. There's no way for us to get in there and clean it. So, and then on the filters, make sure that your, your changing of the filters is on a master sanitation schedule. And just have them put dates on the fil filters with a sharpie so when you go up there and check you can tell when the last time that those filters were changed out uh, but we have to make sure that this air particularly particularly after filtration is as clean as possible uh, when it's going into a, to our plant so that we can protect our products from high apc counts foliage bacteria or even worse environmental issues that might be coming in through the air it's coming from the roof. So you can go to the next slide, please, Lena. So other master sanitation schedule issues I see, it's the air units inside the plants. So the units and cooling units on the ceilings of your production area, these could also be blowing contaminants onto your food contact services and your food itself. Uh, so it's, it's time to get out the ladder, a scissor lift. Yeah, you gotta get up and inspect these units, make sure that these are being cleaned properly, that they're on the master sanitation schedule. These get neglected also because it's hard for QAs to go up and inspect that they have been clean. But you gotta make sure you got cleaning procedures that include cleaning the tops of those units, uh, removing the fan guards, cleaning the fan guards, cleaning the fan blades, the internal unit housing, gotta make sure that's getting clean. And particularly the drip pans. You see this second picture here, it's filthy. Uh, that's blowing all over this facility, okay? So we also recommend placing time release quad quaternary ammonium strips in the drip pans uh, that are water activated. Uh, every time water hits them, that's in the third picture, that orange round thing, that's a quat strip. Every time water hits that, it releases quat sanitizer, kills the bacteria. So you gotta make sure your drip pans are properly plumbed as well, okay? Uh, preferably they need to be plumbed to a drain and not just onto the floor. But uh, we need to make, sure that that plumbing is flush and clean during the unit cleaning as well, because microbial activity is common in these drainage lines. You see the fourth picture is a bowed drainage tube that has standing water in it. That fifth picture just shows a, a drainage tube that's coming down from a drip pan that has obvious mold growth inside of it. So you can go to the next slide, please, Elena. So next we're gonna talk about drains. We're uh, one of the biggest culprits of bringing microbial activity out into our plants. When, when the drains back up, uh, all that nastiness is brought up into your food processing area. Anything that comes in contact with that backed up drain water, like forklifts, wheels, boots, uh, that spreads the pathogens throughout your plant. So make sure that you have drain backup procedures in place. And you really, you need proper drain cleaning procedures for your facility. Backed up drains are a chronic issue in your facility, then you've got a food stock safety problem that needs to be addressed as soon as, po uh, as soon as possible. So ultimately fixing the drainage problems through construction 
Uh, that's the best answer, but that's expensive. A lot of downtime. Uh, so if you do have these drain issues, like these pictures that you see, at least until you, you can get them fixed properly, you need to have professional contractors jet your drains and then put that drain jetting activity on your master sanitation schedule. You might have to do it every week to avoid these kind of problems, but this is bad. Also, you got to train your people. They can't be removing drain baskets and, and blasting product down the drains because that's the root cause of, of this issue. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Elaine. So the last big thing I see when it comes to master sanitation schedule issues in these plants is equipment breakdown. Uh, many of the food processing equipment that, uh, that, that we use require electronic components that are considered sensitive to sanitation. So start checking, start looking inside your equipment's paneling that cover these sensitive uh, components. Now this equipment's all designed to be sealed, but if even one bolt is missing or a seal is cracked, moisture is getting in and microbial growth is happening. So check your master sanitation schedule or these might be on your preventative maintenance programs uh, for how, how often maintenance is removing equipment panels and, and cleaning out the insides. But if you're walking by this kind of equipment and, and there's offensive odor, you got problems. So the second picture here is a four max and the third is a dicer. You see those panels, the bottom panel on the dicer, the third picture is, is taken apart. And that fourth picture is the inside. Uh, both of the insides of, of these equipment weren't getting broken down and cleaned properly, weren't on the mass sanitation schedule. The inside of both of them tested positive, positive for listeria. You can go to the next slide, please, Elena. So that's that's not everything on master sanitation schedules. It's just some of the most common issues I see in the field. But now let's get into some sanitary design items. Uh, and and like my master sanitation uh, schedule slides, this is just a couple of examples of what we see in the field with sanitary design opportunities. A, a true sanitary design presentation could be a hundred slides uh, and with this uh, association consisting of food processing equipment manufacturers there's probably a lot of people on <clears throat> on this call that that know more about sanitary design than i do so uh but i would just like to say that uh in the 19 years i've been with pssi uh the equipment designs have gotten so much better in the last two decades from a sanitation standpoint so thanks to all you food industry equipment engineers who've helped uh, enhanced all these food safety programs. Uh, great job to you all. You can go to the next slide, Elena, please. So here are the basic sanitary design principles for equipment as defined by the North American Meat Institute. We want our equipment to be cleanable to a microbiological level. We want it to be made of cleanable materials. We want it to be accessible to be cleaned. Uh, we don't want it to hold or collect water. We want it to be sealed, no niche areas. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but uh, I just wanted to go over a sanitary design experience that I've observed with conveyors and then just look at some additional common harborage areas that I'm seeing out in the plant. You can go to the next slide, Elena. So PSSI, we clean tens of thousands of conveyor belts every night, maybe hundreds of thousands. I don't even know. It's the most common thing that we clean. So that's kind of what I concentrated on here. Some of the belts that we clean are the newer design. We see the four pictures at the bottom here with good sanitary design principles, but a lot of them are still the old uh, designs that are very difficult to clean. We want them all to be as cleanable as possible from a microbiological level. Uh, we want them to be non-porous surfaces. We want removable guide rails inside those conveyors. We want easy access to the insides of those conveyors. That's what we're looking for. These newly designed belts, are just so much easier to clean than, than the, the old designs. Uh, and the thousands of ATP bioluminescent swabs that I've taken over the years just show that the biofilms are just easier to remove from these, uh, these newer design surfaces. So you can go to the next slide, please, Elena. So here's an example <clears throat> of an incline or a couple incline conveyors that sanitation can't clean the insides of because the framework prevents access you see that first picture with the oval that's a framework covering the inside of that belt that we just can't get get to so and the the insides of these conveyor systems absolutely need to be cleaned on a nightly basis but the only proper way uh, to do that is to remove the belt and this takes even the most skilled 
and experienced maintenance workers a ridiculous amount of time to do. Uh, and then they have to put it back on in the morning. So between taking it off, cleaning it, putting the belt back on, uh, we're talking hours of downtime every morning if you wanted to clean this belt properly. So these belts are from the plant uh, I showed you the roof of earlier. Uh, and that roof portion uh, was just above where these incline belts were. So listeria uh, that was positive on the roof was leaking down from the roof into the production area, and it made its way inside an incline conveyor in between UHMW and stainless steel sandwich points, which we'll talk about next. Please go to the next slide. <clears throat> so we find through environmental monitoring that sandwich points are common harborage areas because they are impossible to clean and they're not taken apart often enough for deep cleaning. So check your facility for these sandwich points. Com commonly it's UHMW bolted flat to stainless surfaces. Sometimes it's stainless bolted onto stainless, uh, but we need gaps between those surfaces so that we can clean them properly every single night. So the top two pictures show the inside of that conveyor, incline conveyor from the previous slide with the belt removed. Uh, there were UHM guide, uh, UHMW guide rail panels bolted directly to the stainless framework, creating large sandwich points. So when these panels were removed, uh, microbial growth was visually evident, as you can see in the upper, upper right hand picture, that green stuff. Uh, so the listeria that came from the roof leaked into the plant and all microbes catch a ride, uh, it found its way to this food source inside the sandwich point because of bad sanitary design and because of lack of master sanitation schedule cleaning on the roof and the belt breakdown of this equipment. So sanitation, sanitation needs accessibility. We need gaps and we don't, we can't have any, no sandwich points. That's what we're really looking for. So next slide, Elena, please. There we go. So lastly, I just want to look at some hollow framework uh, and hollow rollers. Uh, the industry has gotten way better at this over the years, but there's still tons of old stuff out there uh, that are ho hollow and are harborage points for microbial activity. Uh, we basically consider any exposed hollow framework to be contaminated with microbial growth. So just make sure uh, that you're removing these old designs uh, as you tour your, your facilities and that you're replacing them with angle iron, cleanable framework and solid rollers. Uh, so that's basically all I had today. Uh, we'll take questions at the end. Uh, uh, if you need to help any, identifying any of this stuff at your facility, you can contact PSSI, contact Lily. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to PSSI's corporate microbiologist. Josie, it's all you. Thanks, Ryan. Hello everyone, my name is Josie Grief peterson and as Ryan said, I am the Corporate Microbiologist for PSSI Food Safety Solutions. My section of the presentation is on environmental monitoring. And as Ryan mentioned, a lot of the same food safety principles used in animal-based processing are used in plant-based processing. And the same is true for environmental monitoring practices. Next slide, please. Environmental monitoring is a way of scientifically verifying that food safety systems are working as intended. Examples of food safety systems to be verified are cleaning and sanitation processes, hygienic zoning of the facility, sanitary design of the equipment, and employee practices like GMPs. The results of environmental monitoring provide insight into the microbial population in the plant. Usually, pathogens are monitored for their presence, and indicator organisms are enumerated and trended. Typically, having an environmental monitoring program is required when the product is exposed to the environment after the kill step and before packaging. Furthermore, it may be required by regulatory agencies and or GFSI, depending on the product. Next slide, please. Having a robust environmental monitoring program 
is just one level of a stair-step approach to verification of food safety and sanitation programs. Each step should include analyzing and trending the collected data. If there are positives during pathogen environmental monitoring, there should be red flags in previous steps that say, hey, there's a problem here. If you aren't seeing these red flags at previous steps, then the verification program needs some revaluation. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at each step. In the first step, pre-operational inspection, the team is using all their senses to evaluate the production area. A visual inspection, smelling for off odors, and touching the equipment for greasiness or sliminess prior to final sanitizer are best practices for effective pre-ops. If there are microbial issues arising, it would be a good idea to observe pre-op to confirm this verification step is working as intended. Next slide, please. The next step in verification is ATP testing. ATP swabs are used to quickly assess the cleanliness of the surfaces, so they make a great tool for immediate sanitation verification, as Ryan mentioned. The presence of ATP on a surface indicates contamination, which could be from food residue, allergens, and or microbes. If all equipment surfaces look and feel clean during pre-op, ATP swabs will give immediate feedback if the surfaces are ready for food contact. Next slide, please. The next two steps of verification involve swabbing the environment for levels of indicator organisms or presence of pathogens. Microbiological testing takes longer to get results compared to ATP testing, but it is specifically looking for microbes that can cause quality or food safety issues. Remember, environmental monitoring is a way of scientifically verifying that food safety systems are working as intended. It is not a way to control pathogens from entering the product. Microbi microbiological issues in the facility should show up in the environment before showing up in the product. If not, the environmental monitoring program is probably not effective. Next slide, please. The last step of food safety and sanitation program verification is finished product testing. Specifics on the sample size, sampling frequency, target microbe, and test method depends on the product. Finished product testing is often not very effective for controlling food safety, but it is used for process and product verification. The idea of this stepwise approach is to catch microbial issues sooner before they reach the finished product. Next slide, please. At some point or another, you should get a positive during your environmental monitoring. A tool that is helpful during an investigation into the source of this pathogen is vector swabbing. Vector swabbing is when you take additional swabs around the initial positive site to see if the contamination has spread. The initial positive site might not be the root cause source. For example, you may have gotten an initial positive in a drain, but with vector swabbing, you find out the source is a cracked hollow table leg. When collecting vector swabs, it's recommended to take three to five samples in varying directions away from the initial positive site for three consecutive days. Vector swabbing is like being a detective solving a mystery. Each new swab should bring you a clue closer to determining the root cause of the microbial issue. Another tool for monitoring and investigating is EMP mapping. Environmental monitoring program mapping is simply a way to visualize environmental monitoring results on a facility map. It's a helpful tool to point out problems in the environment. When starting out, it can be as simple as printing out a facility map and using push pins on a cork board to mark the swab sites. The next level mapping could be having an electronic map that includes hygiene zones and traffic patterns, plus the swab locations. And the most sophisticated mapping tools are dedicated mapping software that may also feature swab scheduling and corrective action tracking. I think each level of mapping has its place and each can add value. Next slide, please. 
Thanks, and I'll turn it back to Lily to wrap up the presentation. All right. Thank you, Josie, for those points. So uh, in conclusion, we hope we you have enjoyed uh, our webinar and found this information helpful, particularly if you are entering into the plant-based meat industry. Um, as we've uh, shared with you, it is one of the fastest growing segments in the food industry, one that we are personally experiencing, the cleaning of these new locations. Uh, over the next five years, the industry as a whole is estimated to approach $10 billion. Um, within the seg uh, this industry itself, the um, product type that's most popular in uh, product source would be the beef and burgers. Um, with regards to cleaning a animal-based versus uh, plant-based, they are pretty similar. Uh, Ryan talked about the importance to make sure that the master sanitation schedule is uh, staying current, and in particular, the importance of ensuring that that includes the cleaning of your roof surfaces, um, the air handling units, and having a thorough and robust drain program. We can't emphasize that enough with what we see. Um, in addition to that, um, you have to ensure that the frequency of your complex equipment um, is done with the right frequency uh, in general, but also from a preventative maintenance standpoint. And then also um, to ensure that you have the right sanitary design. I know we love it when our partners uh, ask for our input and feedback when a new piece of equipment is just a thought, not when or after the fact. So um, as you are exploring either the uh, production of new equipment or uh, you are interested in, in purchasing new equipment, um, whether you're in-house or, or outsourced uh, for cleaning, we urge you strongly, I don't think we can emphasize it enough, to give thought to the cleaning component, the selection of the metals, things of that nature, because you know once it's produced, it's really hard to um, make any of those changes. So um, with that design in mind, really to make sure, as uh, the pictures illustrated earlier, that there is accessibility to really inspect the equipment well, um, maintain it well, and that it is able to be cleaned daily uh, well. And then in addition to that, ensure to the extent possible that there are no sandwich points or hollow rollers or framework and if you do have those situations that you explore looking into replacing them um, as time and, and budgets permit and then last uh, Josie gave a great presentation on the importance of having a proper environmental uh, program we don't want to see you know have to wait to see the finished product that something is showing up want to catch it early ideally during that pre-op stage. So with that being said, uh, on behalf of Josie, Ryan, myself, and PSSI, we thank you for your time. And Elena, we will turn uh, the webinar back to you. Uh, and, and thank you so much. Thank you, Lily. Uh, thank you, PSSI, for, for doing this session today. Um, I can speak for the Food Safety Network. We greatly appreciate having uh, PSSI's leadership, not only within the network, but also uh, Lily will be attending Process Expo. So for those who wanna you know, connect with PSSI or the Food Safety Network, uh, please stop by uh, Process Expo in Chicago. Um, the event will be going on November 2nd through the 5th. Um, I know many uh, plant uh, processors out there have been invited to the event. And if you have any questions at all about Process Expo, please reach out to me. Um, my contact information information is online uh, at fpsa.org. Uh, if you have any questions for PSSI, please uh, reach out to Lily over LinkedIn. Um, and Lily, as you could tell, she's not only is she an expert in, in plant-based, but she also happens to be our pet food representative. Um, so she, she really knows her stuff. And if you're a special industry segment, I bet you Lily can get you uh, connected with the really uh, great options and solutions when it comes to food safety that PSSI has to offer. Um, so again, thank you all for attending the, the session. I'm going to end the recording here. For those who are joining us on the live recording, um, we will answer your questions after I stop the record. Thank you.